Liu Changqing at Changsha, visiting the house where Di Ji lived. You served three years down here in your demotion, a land still heavy with Chu Yuan's ancient sorrow. So long after you left, I came here through autumn grass, through the cold empty forest and the slanting light of dusk. Emperor Wen ruled well, yet you he slighted. As the Xiang rolled by, did it hear your elegy? Standing in the solitude of silent hills and rivers, I wonder why you came to such a god-forsaken place at all. So we continue with Liu Changqing's uh, heptasyllabic regulated poems. Now, previously when we had talked about uh, Liu Changqing, we mentioned that he spent most of his lifetime in the south, and a lot of those, uh, uh, a lot of those years in retirement, in forced rustication. And one of the places he must have passed by, as this poem clearly makes uh, evident, is Changsha. Now, Changsha was in the south of China, present-day Hunan. And it was a place connected to a scholar of the past called Jiaji. We've already talked about Jiaji. In fact, Liu Changqing has already talked to us about Jiaji because he has a poem in the pentasyllabic section, the last one, written on New Year's Day, which, if you will remember, concluded with, Now I am like Jiaji, exiled to Changsha. How many more years till I go home again? So we talked about Jiaji in that poem and in other poems because he is a figure that usually appears as an example of the of the worthy scholar official who is um, unrecognized and sent into exile, usually paired with uh, Chu Yuan. This already happens in the work of Han historians, uh, that is Suma Qian's Qiji, Qiji uh, the records of the grand historian, include a biography dedicated to both these figures, to Chu Yuan and Yaji, including texts of their work. So very quickly, who was Yaji? So Yaji was a scholar official, who lived uh, at the founding of the Western Han Dynasty. So basically the first half century, the first 50 years, even less, of the, um, the second century before Christ. And uh, some of his writings have been preserved, mainly full poems, prosimetries, some essays. And uh, basically he was famous uh, because he was a very bright uh, youth. He served Emperor Wen of the Han Dynasty. And, but he very quickly made very radical proposals for, for reinforcing central government and uh, the emperor's powers. And the old guards uh, officials um, thought him too dangerous and therefore sent him in a semi-exile uh, to the kingdom of Changsha in the south of the empire to serve as grand tutor to its young king Wu Chan. Now, uh, Changsha, the kingdom of Changsha, this time, we're talking of the early Western Han Dynasty, was a peripheral territory in the frontier between the empire and what was not the empire. It was a land full of water and uh, lakes and of a semi-tropical climate, which meant that it was, uh, you know, a hotbed for tropical diseases, for malaria, uh, for mosquito infestation. So um, people in northern China weren't too keen on going to the south. In fact, they considered it a delayed death sentence in a way. Now, while he was in the south, he, the Jiaji composed some sad uh, texts um, about his situation. The most famous of one is, is Fu Nao Fu, Fu Nao Fu, uh, the, um, the, the owl, um, which is about a bad dream, uh, uh, and an owl that came to see him at night. Uh, he also composed a poem called Lament for Chu Yuan, in which he patterned himself on the famous uh, late warring states uh, um, scholar official Chu Yuan, of whom we've talked a lot about, who was also the example of a man who served his ruler and was rejected by him, and uh, who committed suicide, throwing himself into the Miluo River with a stone. So uh, Jiaji, mm, writing a lament for Chu Yuan and throwing it into the river Xiang, is evocating and, in, and modeling himself on Chu Yuan. And now, <laughs> at two levels of distance, and some, let's say, 500 years, after Jiaji, Liu Changqing is patterning himself, modeling himself first 
on uh, Jiaji, but secondly on Xu Yuan as well. So this is very typical of the scholar officials. You know, they create their own tra intellectual tradition, their own heroic models of scholar officials who are worthy but are rejected. So Jiaji was generally taken as a model for the Confucians, although one would be a pains to describe him as Confucian if you read his biography or take a look at his texts. Um, you know, the Han era was a period of intellectual syncretism in which different intellectual uh, philosophies and schools were merged into a kind of official doxa which patterned the unified empire. Uh, Yaji is very legalistic. That was one of the schools of the Warring States period, the one that advocated ruthless government control of society, strong central government, strict laws, um, harsh punishments and rewards to persuade people. And, you know, this was pretty much at odds with the Confucian political philosophy, which advocated persuasion through virtue, through merit, and um, the fragmentation of political power into a family-type structure of, of the king and his relatives, the feudal lords. So from this point of view, if you read some of the essays or some of the poems of Jiaji, he's staunchly legalistic, like he defends the central government and the power of the emperor. On the other hand, some other of his texts do introduce part of the Confucian criticism of legalism, especially uh, his famous essay, um, Disquisition Finding Faults with Qin, Guo Qin Lun. It's an essay which uh, criticizes the Qin dynasty uh, for being too ruthless, too hard on the people. And it was probably one of the first apologetic texts that established the intellectual and political justification for the Han dynasty by contrasting it a bit hypocritically and a bit excessively with the Qin, like, like the Han were a good Confucian dynasty that ruled through virtue and merit, while, while, the Han were, while the Qin were merciless and rigorous and legalistic. And we know that the Han actually did a merge of both things. They were more, very, very legalistic in practice. That is, the laws of the Han dynasty were pretty harsh, pretty rigorous, with collective punishment for family members and, uh, you know, mutilations, death penalty, um, castration, you know, things like that, tattooing, so pretty harsh laws, but anyway. So, uh, after all this detour, so, back to the poem. So, Liu Changqing is passing through Changsha. He visited Jiaji's house and he composes a poem commemorating this great model, this great sage for antiquity. Incidentally, on, on another side note, uh, Jiaji's former residence is still standing. It was a reconstruction, I believe, built during the Qing dynasty. But and now, you know, it includes temples and halls and everything uh, to homage this great figure of the past. Um, uh, it's now called, or it was called, the Chujuan and Jiaji Temple now. And if you go to China, and if you go to Changsha, you can visit it. So, uh, let's, uh, the poem, what's the poem about? Well, evidently on a poem homaging Jiaji, First, you could say it's perhaps a landmark poem because, you know, it's uh, Liu Changqing visiting a famous landmark connected with a famous scholar of the past. But the main element here is complaint. It's an indirect complaint at uh, Liu Changqing's own forced reclusion on his expulsion from posts in office. We have talked about his biography. He had many periods in which he waxed and waned and in which he was ousted from office, mainly not through any blame of his own, but through the rise and fall of his patrons. But in this poem, you know, he's describing um, Jiaji's fall, and it's obviously the undertext that is meant to be read is Liu Changqing's own absence from office. Yeah? And this is all emphasized not only by talking about Jiaji, but by including a somber autumn atmosphere in which uh, Liu Changqing is visiting Changsha, which, remember, Chinese correlative thought, this background is mm, resonating with uh, Liu Changqing's and Jiaji's feelings of sadness, of melancholy, of decline, and so on. So, as usual, let's take a look at the poem couplet by couplet. First couplet. You served three years down here in your demotion, a land still heavy with Chu Yuan's ancient sorrow. So for three years was, uh, was uh, Jiaji made a tutor to the king of Changsha. After that, he was recalled to the capital, but he didn't manage to, you know, prosper or enjoy 
life much. She was made the tutor of one of Emperor Wen's sons, but the son died in, due to a fall from a horse, and Yaji, depressed and grief-stricken, died a year later. So for three years he was here in this land, and this land is described as a land still heavy with Chu Juan's ancient sorrow. The territory of Changsha was quite in the south of the Han Empire, corresponding to part of the old kingdom of Chu. And remember, Chu Yuan was uh, an officer in the warring states kingdom of Chu. And he had killed himself here, so the land is still sad. It still feels the sorrow of Chu Yuan. This is a depressing land. Nothing good is said about Changsha or the south in this poem. No appreciation of it in any way. It's a depressing, miasmatic, uh, horrible place of exile. So the first couplet introduces us directly to Yaji and to the place. So three years you spent here, this is a sad land. Second couplet. So long after you left, I came here through autumn grass, through the cold, empty forest, in the slanting light of dusk. So the second couplet moves us to the present. The first couplet, as usual, introduces us to the topic, in this case, Yaji's land of exile, with overtones of the old sorrow from Chu Yuan. Second couplet puts uh, Liu Changqing in the forefront. He says, I've come here. And he comes here when? Uh, he comes here in autumn, and we get three autumn sad images which are supposed to intensify to underscore the sadness, the melancholy of being at Changsha. Not only is the land depressing, it's the depressing time of year, and nature is sending all its mm, pessimistic, sad, melancholy mm, images of autumn. Yeah? So, autumn grass, it's drying, it's dying. Cold, empty forest. The forest is empty, no animals. Perhaps the leaves have, have fallen from the trees. In the slanting light of dusk. There's not much light. It's sunset, which is, again, the most melancholy part of the day, the autumn of the day. And, you know, the slanting light of dusk. I love this image. It evokes one of my favorite ones. Uh, Pisando la dudosa luz del día from Gongora in the Soledades. Okay, so it's a sad place, it's a sad time of year, it's a sad time of day. And all of this is merging into Liu Changqing's sad thoughts as he reminisces, mainly Jiaji, and directly to Yuan. Third couplet, so the third couplet centers squarely on Jiaji and on this evocation of this writer from the past. Emperor Wen ruled well, yet you he slighted. As the Xiang rolled by, we did hear your elegy. Now, to understand this couplet, you need that biographical information about uh, Jiaji, which we mentioned earlier on. So, Jiaji mainly served Han Wendi, the, that was the third emperor of the Han dynasty, and he was the stabilizer. He was uh, uh, an emperor that managed to consolidate uh, the hand's grasp of power. Uh, he ruled during a period of, I think, 20 years or so of relative peace and prosperity. He hardly uh, mm, participated in any military campaigns. His taxation wasn't excessive. If we are to believe the historians, his rule was a relatively benign and uh, positive age. In fact, uh, the rule of, of, of Wen, Emperor Wen and his son, Emperor Jin, were generally placed together as the time of Wen and Jin and used as a as a, as, as, as a you know, common phrase for a time of peace, stability and prosperity. Emperor Wen was heavily influenced by his Taoist wife, uh, Consort Do, and uh, he was a, a strong proponent of the Wu Wei uh, policy of minimal uh, intervention on the part of the emperor and letting things you know, sort themselves out for the most part. So he had a very good reputation as a good ruler, but even the best of rulers can make mistakes. And, you know, for the Confucian scholar tradition, the greatest mistake probably of, um, of Emperor Wen, or one of the important mistakes, would have been slighting and not paying heed to the good advice of Jiaji. So he ruled well, but Jiaji suffered. And uh, his suffering was exile. And uh, as we said before, one of the things he did in his Changsha exile was write an elegy to Chu Yuan and throw a copy of it into the Xiang River, which is what is referenced in the second line. Did the river, as it rolled by, hear your elegy? The river that took the paper manuscript, or it wasn't paper, I think paper hadn't been invented yet. Perhaps bamboo strips or silk, or whatever. 
Did it take it with you? Did, did, did it take the poem with, with itself, with its flow? Finally, the last couplet, which usually summarizes and wraps everything up. And it, again, it pushes us back to the, to the protagonist, that is, to the poetic persona of Liu Changqing. You could say there is a, a, a zigzag motion in this um, poem, like the first couplet about Ya Ji, second couplet about Liu Changqing, third couplet back to Ya Ji, fourth couplet back to Liu Changqing. Standing in the solitude of silent hills and rivers, I wonder why you came to such a God-forsaken place at all. So the poem ends with Liu Changqing in the forefront with his melancholy thoughts. He's alone. He's in a solitude of silent hills and rivers. This is autumn. This is sadness. The exiled Liu Changqing is lonely as can be. And he is thinking, reminiscing, meditating on Ya Ji having been sent here. Of course, it's a rhetorical question. He doesn't need to wonder why he came to that God-forsaken place. He was sent to that God-forsaken place, just as Liu Changqing was probably also rusticated and sent to Changsha or its whereabouts uh, while he was demoted and uh, not given an official position. So, not a bad poem. A good example of... Um, of indirect criticism, yeah, of taking a model from the past to criticize the present, of talking about oneself, borrowing a figure, a ghost, a model from the remote past.